All right, it is 4.47. We will hear back from the breakouts. Uh, we have three people who will give four to five minute presentations just summarizing what was discussed. Then we'll have a brief closing panel and head to reception about an hour from now. So Renee, please tell us what you discussed. Uh, thank you, Anne. So we had a, an engaged discussion on indicators which uh, you know, proceeded uh, on the basis of uh, what we already have uh, discussed at uh, the panel, uh, at the plenary panel this morning. Um, I will try to give a fair uh, representation of what has been uh, said, but um, I, I do ask people to jump in uh, from my group uh, if I say something wrong, of course. Well, I want to add something, please do. So what I will throw out is uh, some uh, bullet points which, um, which I think uh, captured uh, the main points of uh, our discussion. I think generally, uh, as also during our panel was apparent, there is some hesitation uh, for, uh, for, for proposals on indicators when it comes to, to the actual evaluation of researchers. Therefore, some uh, suggested uh, to start with a more descriptive uh, form of uh, of uh, using indicators for the adoption of open science practices rather than going directly to evaluation purposes. Um, that we try to do this on the basis of an uh, adoption of, for example, uh, open data, open access, and open collaboration uh, um, part. Um, that we look to the level of is institutions rather than to, to individual resources uh, in terms of uh, whether these institutions actually follow good open science practices. Um, then we had a, a number of uh, issues which uh, makes uh, the issue of metrics and indicators for open science complicated uh, on the technical level, I would say. First of all, we have the issue of uh, making data citable and making this on a, on a systematic and standardized way, which is uh, obviously not now the case, apart from the fact that um, researchers are apparently not very good in doing that. Uh, on the top of this, we, we face, I think, uh, an infrastructure which is very fragmented. So by default, any metrics we now use is based on uh, on fragmented insight uh, of the data available. Uh, this is of course has been the point of, uh, th this was actually the motivation to have something like a European Open Science Cloud because all only under this condition of a transparent open uh, infrastructure, you actually uh, have the possibility of, um, of doing also uh, an assessment in terms of uh, how actively data are shared and reused and um, and produced for research. So um, this requires, of course, some technical points, which was also raised in the group's requirements in terms of orgit uh, document document of identification number, uh, you know, um, unique and uh, unique uh, um, unique uh, numbers for identifying uh, data objects, etc. Um, and then I learned uh, a fantastic uh, new word, uh, a new word, and this is really uh, this really made my day. That is the term now casting. Did uh, did anybody uh, is anybody familiar in the room here? Ah, not so many. I'm relieved. I thought I was. <laughs> so so okay, but uh, this time, well, what because we have of course looked to a uh, very much again also in terms terms of data citation and. Um, data reuse in terms of what is the scientific outputs in terms of open science. But what we are also interested in is, of course, in real-time open science, as, you know, for example, was presented in, in examples by Rich Call this morning, where it is about uh, sharing raw data instantly, for instance, by means of electronic notebooks worldwide. And there the interest is, of course, not for research evaluation or assessment, but it's of course to it's a practice which should be become rewardable, and this actually the essence of uh, of um, of open science. And for that aspect, there seem to be something like now casting, something where we could follow this, and tools are in development there. Um, if you want to hear more, David is the expert here. And then 
uh, David uh, Osimo. Uh, and then um, finally, maybe, uh, I think that's within the four minutes, I hope, uh, we see probably the use of data management plans as an opportunity for the further development uh, of, um, of these type of activities, also in terms of uh, how open or how data actually are reused and shared uh, uh, already during the project rather than only at the end. And uh, this could also lead to perhaps the requirements of using open uh, electronic notebooks, etc. I think I leave it by that. I'm sure I uh, did not capture everything, but uh, my four minutes are over. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And who's reporting out on open access, please? That was a great joke. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I am uh, Nick Shockey, also of, uh, of Spark, and we had a great discussion about uh, open access ranging from uh, sort of what, what's happening in the EU, EU and hearing even more details from Jean-Claude uh, to sort of more basic conversations about sort of the fundamentals of open access and differences. And we sort of started off with a really bold prediction from Jean-Claude, which I really liked, which is that uh, in two to three years, the system uh, will be flipped, which is, uh, I think, heartening. But we sort of went straight from that into a question of, um, you know, is that possible? Or, you know, perhaps even more importantly, what will that system, uh, what will that system look like? Uh, and we had a really great uh, point of information from Heather Pivovar from from Impact Story, who's done sort of a large scale analysis on you know, sort of what accessibility currently looks like. Uh, and she shared that uh, you know, with their OA DOI data set, they estimate that about 50% uh, of articles with Crossref DOIs are free to read somewhere uh, right now, uh, but that most of that, that isn't reusable. And we had a pretty developed uh, sort of conversation around the differences between uh, public access uh, and uh, open access. Uh, with Carly Robbins from, Robinson from the uh, Department of Energy sort of talking about uh, the differences between those, which I think is a really important uh, thing to consider, you know, sort of Jean-Claude's bold claim about sort of the two to three year time frame uh, for a big flip and sort of what will that, that look like? Will research articles just be sort of free uh, to read when you sort of fire up your computer to read something online or will they come with, uh, with full reuse rights, um, you know, which is very clearly where uh, the EU is headed, as we've seen uh, multiple times uh, from this stage. And at the beginning, Jean-Claude shared a few more details about sort of their, their thinking there, which were really interesting uh, about how they are, you know, sort of viewing the EU Open Science Cloud as a way to really push uh, the conversation ahead in the EU. Uh, and he had some really interesting words to share about sort of strongly incentivizing publishers, uh, you know, to really change and adopt a fully open access. Uh, system and sort of spoke to speaking or uh, publishing in quote real open access journals uh, and not hybrid ones, uh, which I thought was a particularly important point in sort of defining what the future will look like given sort of the uh, you know resistance to change that can come from from that hybrid business model. Uh, the conversation also shifted a bit to talk about sort of uh, you know how open access is uh, sort of an important foundation for open research more broadly in that topic within that broader area that we really sort of dug down uh, in on was uh, text and data mining and sort of treating research articles uh, as data in and of, uh, in and of themselves uh, and sort of how there's so much potential uh, there right now, but it's also you know, one that's largely unrealized given how difficult it is for researchers uh, to get access to do text and data mining. And, we discussed, you know, a couple examples of where research have, you know, have tried to do that, and they have the, you know, technological capability to scrape the articles, even if they're not in, you know, the most machine-readable formats. Uh, but then that can lead to them getting their entire institutions' access to publisher platforms uh, shut off. Just as one example of the barriers where, you know, it's technically possible, um, but if we don't have full reuse rights, that's sort of where, um, you know, the real possibilities uh, stop. We also covered a few uh, examples of communities where uh, data sharing is becoming more and more uh, the norm. Uh, and it was interesting, uh, the diversity of topics that we covered. This actually came up originally in the context of, uh, of ancient scrolls. 
uh, where they're made accessible and translated, and you have you know sh you know short period of exclusivity, but then anybody can get access to them to you know build their scholarship on top of. Uh, and then you know we talked about how there are similar uh, examples um, in other communities from you know NOAA and atmospheric information to NASA. Uh, the high energy phoenix, uh, physics and seeing where sort of that expectation of sharing is bubbling up in different disciplines and, and becoming the norm. Uh, and then finally, one of the things we touched on at the very end was uh, the question of language um, and sort of, you know, how you handle diversity of, of language. And I wish we'd had more time to sort of delve into this topic because, you know, it, to me, that's one sort of aspect of a much larger question about how do we build a system for you know open research open scholarship that's equitable that includes you know non-native english speakers or folks you know that speak other languages um, or to you know even broader questions that honestly didn't come up in our session but i think are important things for this group to consider like you know the the impact that the sustainability models that we use to you know fund a system for open research how they influence you know how equitable that system is and really making sure that as we're laying the foundation for a new open system for research um, you know, that it's one that's built for everybody and doesn't sort of replicate inequities, um, you know, that have historically been present in the research system, you know, that we should pay attention into and try to uh, address in, in the open system uh, that we're, we're moving to. Um, so if there are other people in the group uh, that uh, like to raise points that, that I may have missed, uh, please feel free to do so. That sounded very comprehensive, but would anyone like to raise an additional point? Okay, someone would. Comment on the language issue that again comes back to machine readability because if you publish your major results in machine readable format first, then you can output them in any language you want if your thesaurus is rich enough. So it's part of the equitability as well. Mm -hmm. Machines, you know, don't care. They put out polydysmia in French and malaria in English. Who cares? Yeah. Thank you. And final breakout on citizen science and open science. And a huge thanks to Alison Parker. I asked her to report back on this, I think, three hours ago, and she kindly agreed. No problem. All right, so we had a really interesting discussion about citizen science and open science and sort of how they fit together, how they're different. Um, we started with a discussion more about the terminology, how people sort of conceptualize open science and citizen science. Um, I think everyone in the group agreed that they aren't really distinct categories of things, um, but that there's a lot of overlap. And I think most people thought that open science was a good umbrella term where citizen science would fit um, underneath it. Uh, and that sort of led to a discussion about some overarching policies and definitions we have either in the US or in Europe, and whether those types of uh, infrastructure would be helpful or actually restrict innovation um, and maybe something to be avoided. And then uh, we talked a lot about sort of the ethical components of um, citizen science, especially sort of the role of citizen science in, in introducing some complexity that we maybe don't think enough about with science in general um, and how citizen science can play the role of highlighting particular issues in science or sort of ethical and social dimensions of, I guess, both science and open science. Um, from there, the conversation shifted a bit to questions about sort of responsibility and, and data quality, I think mostly in terms of citizen science and sort of who is responsible for thinking about what infrastructure is needed for generating uh, useful and reliable data um, and what, what needs to be in place to be able to sort of responsibly involve people uh, in science. And we talked a lot about um, different strategies for data quality and data validation and things like that for citizen science projects, depending on the type of project, what it's going to be used for, or what the data will be used for in the scale, whether it's a small scale or large scale project. Um, and then finally, we talked, again, a lot about um, sort of ethical issues of thinking about the concept of fair data um, and thinking about that attribution part of it and how that plays out in a citizen science context, whether 
um, citizen science projects are adequately dealing with uh, attribution. Um, I think I covered everything. Does anyone in the group want to add to that? Great, thanks. So we have one final panel on next steps for open science. And the format of this uh, is a bit different. We'll start by having Jared Banks give his perspective on his role in facilitating international cooperation and some reflections on today's conversations. Uh, then we have Bonnie Carroll who has some wonderful slides summarizing what was discussed today and putting it in context. And then actually, instead of Renee, we have Jean-Claude who will uh, <laughs> make some recommendations for concrete next steps. And then I'll open it up to the audience to get your thoughts on concrete next steps. So please come up to the stage one more time. <laughs> Would you like to? Or I could be there. <laughs> you can sit if you like. You don't. All right, I'll go ahead and. Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. Uh, one of the advantages of coming at the end of, a, of such a rich discussion is that there's been such a rich discussion, so much uh, great sharing of information. One of the disadvantages is everybody's eager to continue the discussion and probably make it to the reception after this, and I feel like I'm standing between uh, a rich discussion and a party, you know, uh, listening to me, but um, this has really been a great discussion, and uh, for... Um, for some of you, you may be wondering why is the State Department, which is not a science agency, even here and part of this discussion? Um, so I'd like to say just a couple of things at the, at the top um, about why this matters and, and why it matters to us from a foreign policy perspective also. Uh, I think that um, some of this we've heard already. I think that uh, Elizabeth Kutcher did a great job presenting some of the milestones, not just from N the NIH perspective, but more broadly across the executive branch and several administrations uh, that have supported the idea of uh, making government data, government funded research and that data available to the public. And I think if, if we were a year from now, one of the other milestones that we would see on a similar presentation is the uh, new, um, uh, under the president's management agenda that was uh, launched earlier this year, uh, just yesterday, uh, that was announced that there's a federal data strategy that has been launched. And if you, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, uh, the data.gov website, um, but there is now a strategy.data.gov website uh, where there's some more details about what this means um, in terms of this administration's um, priorities. And it talks about in a few different ways about enterprise data governance and setting priorities for managing government data as a strategic asset. Uh, it talks about uh, access use and augmentation, developing policies and procedures that enable stakeholders to effectively and efficiently access and use the data. It talks about decision making and accountability, improving the use of data assets for decision making and accountability for the federal government, including internal and external uses. And then it also talks about commercialization, innovation, and public use, uh, and facilitating this government data sets for external stakeholders, uh, which are at the forefront of making government data accessible and useful through commercial uh, uh, uses, innovation, or other public uses. Uh, so I think that's exciting. It's open for comments also, and I would encourage all of you um, to take a look at that website and take some of the feedback and some of the ideas that have come from this and feed them into 
uh, that broader U.S. government strategy discussion about data, uh, and this has been uh, very relevant. Um, I think if you had any of the many different government agencies here, you would get yet another perspective. NIH was one. If our Department of Energy colleagues came up and presented, it would be yet another perspective on how the data is made accessible. If NSF colleagues were brought up here, they would share yet another rich example of the way it is. I was just at the U.S. Geological Survey earlier this week and heard many, many examples again from them on the way in which data is being used. Um, and across the board, there'd be so many. And I think it's impossible in, in this kind of form to capture both the richness and the complexity of what's happening uh, with that data. Uh, but uh, in terms of um, this administration's priorities, I think uh, an important data point to return to is that the Department of Commerce has said that businesses that rely on government data generate close to $400 billion in revenue while delivering products and services that affect the decisions of countless other entities around the globe. In other words, that the, the open science that we've been talking about today, the data that we've been talking about today, is good for science, is good for the public, and it's good for economic growth, which is not limited to one country or another. I mean, we're talking about the U.S. and the EU here, um, but it definitely has positive economic um, um, uh, you know, help. So why the Department of State? Uh, the first uh, reason, I'll, I'm gonna talk about three specific things, reasons why we're here today. Uh, uh, the first is that on the screen, uh, all day long, we've had in front of us here US, uh, EU, US, 20 years of science and technology agreement. And at the Department of State and in my office, we're responsible for the negotiation of those science and technology agreements. We're proud to have that agreement with the EU. The EU is one of our, and the EU member states are really one of our great partners in the science endeavor. Uh, and as part of those science and technology agreements, not just with the EU, but with uh, myriad countries, uh, that data that's generated under that research being made public is a core component of those international agreements. And, and we take that uh, responsibility very seriously to make sure that when we're facilitating government to government cooperation, which our office does, that under those framework agreements and under the like sub agreements and implementing agreements that 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 information uh, is available to the public um, and a benefit to the world so that's the one uh, the second is that, that I would note is um, myself coming most recently from our US mission to the United Nations in Geneva um, that I wanted to just share two very brief personal examples of how I saw that data collection and sharing happening. One is at the, the CERN experiment that I think many of you uh, are familiar with. Fantastic, mind-blowing science that's happening at CERN. And what's also so impressive is the sheer volume of data that's being generated there and then made available on cloud services and available to researchers all over the world to be able to benefit from that research that's happening there, uh, which is just uh, fantastic. And, and the second is that um, I could have said another agency that could have talked about data, it would be NOAA that was here. And just a personal experience that I had, um, an introduction to this, is when NOAA would come to Geneva for the negotiations with the World Meteorological Organization. And they would talk about the sharing of data with the WMO and the harmonization of those, those, those data so that uh, our data could be shared and that other countries sharing their data so that we could benefit from it and the incredible uh, global benefits from that kind of harmonization and data sharing uh, that I saw in Geneva. And the last uh, example that I, I wanna share from a State Department perspective is an example of uh, where citizen science became then science diplomacy, and that is specifically on air quality studies. Uh, about, uh, I think it was 10 years ago exactly this year, in, uh, at our US Embassy in Beijing, uh, 
the foreign service officers were quite concerned about the air quality there and what it meant both for their quality of life and the quality of the life of the, of the Chinese and others living in, in Beijing. And they wanted to know how do, we, how do we not just worry about this, but how do we find out what's really happening in terms of the air quality. And so the uh, US Embassy placed and installed an air quality monitor on our US Embassy to gather scientific data about the air quality. Uh, that was then shared publicly. Shared publicly so that everyone could see what the science and what the data was saying about that air quality. And that experiment was so successful uh, that we now have over 25 U.S. embassies and consulates around the world that have these air quality monitors up there. And if you went to uh, the website airnow.gov, which is a result of the State Department's partnership with EPA on this, you can see that data uh, and download it and manipulate it, look at it, uh, crunch it, analyze it. Uh, and so it's an example of that bridge where a foreign service officer took the, like the citizen science initiative and then partnered with a technical agency. And this became really now an important tool of our science diplomacy for raising awareness on air quality uh, as a health issue, as a uh, scientific issue, as just a, a broader issue for, uh, our, for us as um, citizens of this global community. So with that, I just want to say uh, thank you to the Wilson Center for inviting us to be part of this and for just the fantastic discussion that we've had. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Anne for a very rich and wonderful day. Second of all, I want to thank you for staying here until the very end of the day. I was going to be the last speaker on the last panel of the day, but I was saved by Jean-Claude. <laughs> OK, so um, about my beautiful slides, I began with slides. and. Then I came here, and during the day, I kept editing them, editing them, editing them, and all that may be left that is new under the sun is the graphics on the slides. So um, how many of you are great swimmers? How many consider yourself really good swimmers? Okay, we have a good, a couple of good swimmers. Okay, get your life preservers because, let's go with the slides. You're wondering now, what is she going to do here? I'm wondering too. Yeah, I'm wondering too. <laughs> if you like them, it's my fault. If you don't, it's my assistant's fault. She designed them. And look at the pretty colors there. So when I thought about this workshop and I thought about open science and what we were doing, I'm saying we are on the crest of a tidal wave. It's an incredible, incredible wave. So what is the next steps for cooperation on this wave? And I will say, I was asked to introduce myself. Everyone knows Jean-Claude. Um, I'm Bonnie Carroll, and I'm here as the Secretary General of CoData. Um, I actually am now the Chief Data Officer. I used to be the owner, but I stepped away, um, of Information International Associates, which is a consulting firm. Next. So oh, I can do it here. OK. The one that you can't see. Okay. Wait. <laughs> okay, you like them? Okay. All right. First, um, open science is fed by open data, and open data is nourished by fair data. You can see that it is a food chain, and you need all of them in order for the whole ecosystem to survive. While I was thinking about this, the point was made is it open science or is it open research? Because are we including the social sciences and the humanities? So this is all context for really where we come out today. And that was kind of a new concept. I personally always advocate, let's stick to science. Well, science and social science, because CoData, the, the ICSU is merging with the social science organization. Um, but uh, humanities may be a step too far, just because there's so much to do in just the sciences and then adding in the social sciences. Then there was the scope from PhD to citizen science and all of that. So that's a context we need to look at. And then the last context was man to machine. 
is this open data man to machine and what is that? So these are three aspects of context that I heard during the course of the day. Okay, but there are other fish in this <laughs> sea. Okay, um, there's open science, there's technology cloud, there's data science. We mentioned a little bit when we talked about AI, but that is another part of this enormous wave. Artificial intelligence, which is different than data science, okay, because data science um, is the knowledge of these things, but artificial intelligence is the application. All these words were thrown out, and they are big fish in this sea under the tidal wave. Um, and how do we get these communities together? Because all of these communities have their own thoughts. So I just am advertising for my sponsor. Um, we are planning a workshop on bringing FAIR and reproducibility together. Reproducibility, somebody mentioned in conjunction with integrity. So how does FAIR relate to reproducibility, including integrity of data? November of 2018, it's sponsored by Sendy, a federal agency group, um, Enface, a publisher, a um, uh, content um, trade association, RDA, and the Academy, which is Bertie and CoData. Okay, now, cooperation stimulates challenges and opportunities, um, and I learned what I'm going to say next from an NLM perspective because I was at their data sciences workshop um, and um, I'm working with friends of the National Library. And the EU and the US is that little fish there. And it's swimming into the rest of the world. So we talked about this cooperation. We also mentioned how do we relate to the rest of the world. When I was at NLM, they said, you know, NLM is a pimple on the National Institutes of Health in terms of dollars. In terms of impact in, in this area, it may be more, but in terms of the amount of resources they have to do it, it's a pimple. Then they mentioned all of NIH is a pimple on Facebook and Google and all these big multinational corporations. So if one is going to deal in this ecosystem, one really has to seriously figure out the relationship between this cooperation, the rest of the world, and the big multinationals who are not here today, but need to be incorporated. Okay, so what are some of the barriers? And this comes from other things that I've, I've been ex involved in, but the whole complexity of this ecosystem. I mean, think about it, we're in this wave, we are of this community. We talk about this all the time, and think about the complexity. I mean, how many of you came knowing everything that was said today? Nobody, we're all seeing different pieces of this, and it was a wonderful workshop because we were on this wave and we were getting really tumult about on all these things. So last year, this um, CoData, Sandy CoData RDA National Academy workshop did something on managing digital research objects in an expanding science ecosystem. And the conclusion there, um, which is gonna be written up in the CoData Science Journal in an article, um, was that um, this is a complex ecosystem. Scientists don't understand that ecosystem. They don't know where to go to even get started. We heard pieces, in some cases people know where to go, but in this grand tidal wave, there's really an incredible complexity that is very hard to understand unless you're thinking about it full time. Um, the average scientist by the numbers, okay? Um, we heard about various things. I think the average scientist doesn't have any idea of what we're talking about. They're not connected with this kind of thing. So one of the recommendations in the end is maybe how do we really penetrate the average scientist? And it is a top down, bottoms up, and middle in to get this whole thing working. We all here have been talking very much top down. How do we start really aggressively looking at the bottoms up as well. Our AV team is waving their hands. They would like you to speak into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, consider the complexity in the metrics. Who, oh, um, one of the early speakers was really talking about the numbers um, that he got in order to prove um, the importance of um, um, the impacts of the work that they're doing in uh, medicine. And um, 
think about the complexity of the numbers. How many scientists are we really talking about? Even in the challenge we were talking about, 450 people were in that challenge, and think of the numbers. So there's a considerable complexity in the numbers and the metrics. Okay, good news and bad news, at least in the United States, until what I just heard two minutes ago, it was not a current focus of this administration. The last administration, remember, was the first time that open science, open data, open government was really strong. So there was a concern, um, are we beyond retreat? I'm glad to hear that the current administration has now issued some things that really give guidance that they're committed to this, so that's great. So um, I would change that now. I stopped editing before, <laughs> before that talk. Um, is there movement to a US open science anything to federate with the European open science cloud? How do we organize ourselves in the United States to be good partners in that initiative in Europe? And we talked about that. Okay, so here are opportunity areas. Um, and I took the titles of each of the sessions and I took some notes, some I came with, some I changed. Um, legal, regulatory, and policy. We did last year at the CoData meeting in St. Petersburg a world tour of progress toward open data and open science. And at that, we had 11 countries actually present where they stood in open science. And it was really interesting because you would be surprised. Africa is moving on this. China's way out in this. And so it's really interesting. Those slides can be made available. Um, legal policy, people talked about legal interoperability. I will point out that there's an RDA CODATA legal interoperability group, and also in that the GBIF solution was really fascinating. You had a choice of three intellectual property regimes. You choose one or you don't participate. So those were, I think, interesting thoughts that came out of today. Infrastructure, building commons and platforms. Um, that's really the same theme. We have the European Science Cloud, we have Agave, we had others, many are aspirational. How do we really get them together? We have the, op the African Open Science Platform. Again, CODATA is pushing, its mission is to put African scientists at the cutting edge of contemporary data intensive science as a fundamental resource for a modern society. This African open science platform is really gathering steam. If you wanna know more about it, the International Data Week, which is CODATA, RDA, and World Data System, is meeting in Africa, in Botswana, in uh, first week in, in November, and there'll be a lot of discussion of this platform and hopefully some other platforms that we haven't heard about today. Okay, FAIR, you got my little fish in the sea, and FAIR is really the food stock. And besides FAIR, I heard plus attributable, plus sustainable. And I think those are two very good additions to it. And I know there have been other kinds of additions, so um, uh, that was a good note. How do we incorporate that? And Baron, I'm sure you've been thinking about things like that as well. Um, metrics are hard, okay? Impacts are hard to quantify. Um, from FAIR to open science. You're doing a lot of metrics on FAIR, but how does that relate to open science? And I think we need to look at that, the complexity of the metrics. Um, and um, need, we need to focus and expand um, open science, and we need to monitor that. Technological and interoperability um, standards, again, I might say CODATA is doing data integration initiative. It's cross-disciplinary and it's semantic interoperability because if you can speak the same language in a data set context, you know, if you have the same common measurements, then you can have better interoperability. Um, and if you also look at the infrastructures, there are a lot of technical um, interoperability issues. Cultural. Um, Bertie, um, the Academy Board on Research Data and Information, is looking at creating a roundtable that's on aligning the reward structure for open research, open science, which will be, I think, terrific. They were ahead of the thinking, and they are hopefully going to have that and launch that soon. CoData um, also worked um, with Force 11 on data citation. So there's a lot of work that's done, and there's some very good reports on that. Um, early career researchers in um, culture, people were talking about that. Are young people different? Young people who are different, when they get into the systems, does it change? 
and there's this big silver back pushing them right back to where they've been. So that's something we, I think, need to, to think about. Institutional and governance, um, it's the researcher, stupid. It's top down, bottoms up, whatever. Research structure and incentives are also uh, critical to that. I've never been to a workshop that talked about this where researcher incentives have not been a key cornerstone of moving the agenda forward. And um, governance, it was said in the cloud, Jean Cloud said it's just hard. Governance is just hard. Um, costs and financing. Uh, one thing I haven't heard here, but I've heard in many meetings is, is it a zero sum game. For researchers, remember the average scientist in, in the country and the world, to them, if a dollar in research funding is spent on data, it's a dollar less on research. How do you convince them, no, it's a leverage dollar for better research? So you have that zero sum game issue. And I think the costs and the financing is the elephant in the room. How do we really look at the sustainability? So those are all opportunities, but specifically then looking to the future, um, foresight, right? How do we get foresight into what comes out today? Um, consider the relations of the US-EU cooperation to the rest of the world. Um, and I mentioned there, there um, is a workshop looking at the rest of the world in Botswana in November. Explore partnerships with the big vendors. I mentioned that. That's an opportunity, I think a good one. Um, focus on metrics, and you had some more um, conversations on that. Um, uh, research and applications. You have to look at research met metrics, and then you have to have return on investment, which is the application metrics. Relationship of fair metrics. I mentioned to open, research, open science metrics. I think that's an area for the future. More research on the economics underlying open science and open data, the return on public money, the sustainability, collect the data, aggregate what is known. I think it would be very good to do that. And I think there's even some room for places like NSF to fund some research on the economics of, of data, open data particularly. Citizen science is a fascinating area. Where are the connections? Again, the challenge solvers, there were 450 people in the NLM thing. That's a that's a great beginning, but how do we get that to be scalable? And I know um, you know that's not, that wasn't the only answer, but it's a good start. Um, uptake by the average scientist, bottoms up. Um, is it by necess necessity top down? Um, I think the AAAS, science and nature, can penetrate. I mean, science, I saw, has what? 200,000 recipients, and nature, I don't know how, how many they have. Well, that's a start get more in there so they can have better uptake. Um, work, workforce issues underlies progress. Many people say the human factor, the human resources. So the reward structure, we all know, aligning incentives and focusing on people problems. Somebody mentioned that. I think that's a, an important area. And there are three key words that I heard today. What we do has to be actionable. There has to be alignment and pilots. I think pilots is a good way that you make things real. Okay, we can talk generalities all the time. When you get pilots, it becomes real. And another thing that, you know, Daniel talked about the report on the um, fair data, um, uh, the interim, turning fair data into reality and interim fair data action plan. I think we should all review that because they have incredible content and incredible, there you go. And <laughs> it all came together in credible um, recommendations. And we should comment. Before the 5th of August. OK. And I think that's um, the summary of where I started and what I ended up with as a result of today. And there were some examples. And I think Jean-Claude is going to add on to some examples of things we could do. I, I will be much shorter, uh, I said enough today, and, and uh, as an introduction, because I can skip the presentation of myself, yeah, you had it twice. <laughs> so first of all, I want to say that um, don't, don't, don't make a mistake in thinking that, that what I presented today looks like a well-planned and easy piece of cake that we thought of two, three years ago, and we just executed it, and uh, everyone was happily dancing down the street uh, with us. <laughs> I can guarantee you it wasn't the case. Um, 
I mean, uh, if, if you would have taken notes, I could write several volumes on the anthropology of decision-making in science policy, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is not always rosy and rational, uh, to say the least. Uh, but okay, that doesn't, that doesn't matter, you know. I, I, I said it in, in the discussion we had before, things are complicated, but, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, we, we, we were raised with the Cold War and the Berlin Wall. Now, the day that that fall, I thought, well, if that can happen, you can do anything, you know, so why not... Uh, global interoperable data. <laughs> so that is uh, some, that's the first thing. The <laughs> second thing is, no really, I mean we should be voluntaristic. If, if we are not voluntaristic in this uh, because we want to serve a certain cause, then, then of course if you only extrapolate from the business as usual, well then it will be business as usual bis and not something new. So that is an important lesson that, that I think I wanted to, to transmit at the end, so uh, I was not foreseen that I did it, but anyway, I do it. Now, I also think you have to make a distinction between open science and open scholarship. So open science is a system change, which affects the whole ecosystem. O open scholarship mainly affects the research part of the system, whereas uh, open science affects the funders, it affects the publishers, it, aff it affects the intermediaries and so on, whereas open scholarship is mainly concerned with how a researcher uh, works and, and the environment that enables that. So that is relatively uh, it of course it's part of the same the same issue but but it is uh, it is different to to think about it so narrowing it down to open scholarship or only talking about open science is is, is wrong it, it it is both and then finally as an introduction to my uh, final uh, my, my last proposal i think we should also never learn from the past uh, if you if you see how much our um, due to digital technologies, how, how economics, how politics, how social uh, relationships have changed. Uh, and, and let's be honest, no one ever foresaw uh, what we are witnessing today in terms of, uh, of a digital environment 20 years ago. So we should learn from that, that and keep an open mind for experiment, keep an open mind for what is possible, and not trying to, def to defend per se the entrenched, uh, uh, the entrenched uh, benefits, or entrenched positions, sorry. Okay, all that is an introduction to <laughs> what you asked me to do. Um, and so I think we, we can, I see, and, and this has not been checked with the hierarchy in Brussels, so um, <coughs> it, it, it was checked up to my level, so I agree with it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I see two areas where we can fruitfully work together and where we need to work together uh, because of the nature of, of what we are doing and, and the nature of open science. So first of all, I think we should intensely work together on, on having a common agreement on the metrics for open science. Uh, it is, science is global. Uh, e the EU and the US together represent close to two-thirds of the whole scientific uh, landscape productivity and output. So we have, um, we've, we, we have a keen interest in, in, um, in thinking about it, but we must come up with indicators which are measurable and which are agreeable amongst our constituencies across the globe or well, at least uh, our part of the globe to start with. And, and as well at the level of, of the modus operandi, how is the job of a scientist changing, as at the level of the impact, what does it mean for uh, the quality of science and, and so on. But that I think is, is something very, very important. It is something where we can engage a lot of our uh, scientists, our communities, our stakeholders, and where, where the, the sooner we have it, um, uh, well, not the sooner, the, the, the better. Okay, I also know that as soon as you start measuring, you, you create a lot of perverse effect, but without measuring, you cannot say anything about uh, progress or regression. So you, you need to make a compromise then. That's the first point. The second point where I think we have uh, a, lot of, a lot of work ahead of us and because it's, it's, it's a shared, uh, it's a shared uh, benefit is, uh, and, and it was already uh, mentioned by Bonnie, is that uh, we should start thinking about how to create a global open science cloud. So what we are doing in Europe is a European one, but okay, we are what we are at, at, the, at, at, at the world level of science, but, um, and you are what you are at the world level of science, and together we are a very big part of the world of science. So we should start thinking, and the discussions in the G7 uh, illustrate that it is a discussion that is going on, not only in, in our part of the world, but also in Australia and Canada, uh, also in Africa, uh, you, you mentioned this, so the, the African Open Science Cloud is clearly uh, uh, inspired by, by what we are doing. So science is global, so the cloud should be global. It's, it's as simple as that. And if, if you accept that, then of course you have a lot of, a lot of issues that, that, that are raised because 
the, 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 the principle of organizing a global open science cloud, if you accept that it is useful, should be, I think, uh, the principles we used in Europe, namely, you federate and you, you build it up to a, a common level agreement. It should not be the other way around. So the way you want to do it in the US, well, you do it how you want it, idem dito for the rest of the world. But at some point in time, if you want to push it into the common space, that's where we need to get agreement. And that's where I think we, it will not happen, it will not happen sui generis. Right? It will certainly not happen sui generis. The, the, the history of technology and standards uh, is, is full of, of, uh, of examples where it didn't happen to the detriment of one or the other player. So that's important, and in particular, what is important there is the, the principles of, of reciprocity. Uh, uh, you can access our cloud if, on condition, of course, that we can access your cloud, and not, not in formats and in languages that we do not understand, but in, in, a, in the fair formats. So it, it by default, you come back to, the, the, to, to, the, to the, the whole movement that is now going on with, uh, and it was, was, was uh, illustrated with Go Fair, but and, and is also discussed in the RDA, but by default you come to a, a global approach to, to fair data. And once we would have that, we could relatively easily, I think, pump it up and have a, a, a global open science cloud. Why? Not for the sake of having a global science open science cloud, but because science needs a global uh, perspective and is a global endeavor. And most of our biggest challenges are global anyhow, be it in climate, be it in food, be it in security. So it, it makes perfect sense because, again, it's not for the sake of uh, open for the sake of open, it's open for the sake of uh, relevant, effic efficient, and, and performant science. So, in, so, and if you accept the, the, the principle of reciprocity, it means that at some point in time, we, we, we need to start thinking about the kind of a global uh, science cloud passport that every researcher, there are 8 million now, uh, sh should get, and it will only increase. Is that something useful uh, to start thinking about? Is it doable? Are we going too fast? I don't know, but it certainly is on the table and it will not happen without it. Eh? Just like you cannot access the internet without, or you cannot have a, a web uh, a space on the internet without a domain name. Well, the same will probably happen here. And then I think, and the suggestion was made by, uh, by Bonnie in, 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 in the discussion previously, but it's, I think it's a very good idea to start bottom up here by with case studies. Well, let's try to find it out. Let's bring communities together. And, and let's them, let them say, okay, this is where the direction we want to go, but in, in, in environment, in, in, in biomedic, or, or, in, in, or in oceanography, uh, the blue cloud, for example, is an idea that is floating around. Are these test beds for what we think should become or, or, or a, a global open science cloud? And if so, what can we learn from, from a disciplinary, uh, from, from these uh, discipline-specific um, uh, endeavors? It makes much more sense, I think, to do it that way than the other way around, because then you lose yourself in details. And if you can show two, three test beds where it will really work, we have a, a better case for, uh, for it. So that, I think, is, is in a nutshell um, what, what I wanted to say, and where I think, uh, as a community, a transatlantic community, we can make, uh, we can make progress and where we have a win-win uh, possibility. That was fantastic. Thanks to all three of you. So we have four minutes left. <laughs> and in these four minutes, I would like to hear five actionable ideas from the audience. We can have uh, ideas. Not, you don't even know what I'm going to ask for yet. <laughs> but <laughs> five actionable ideas on next steps for international cooperation in open science. Well, the idea is actually, I mean, you've, you've laid down a roadblock here that I didn't anticipate. I assume that a Kazakh scientist could send his data to the EU, US cloud and share likewise. And now you're telling me there's a barrier of some sort? Uh, this isn't particularly good news. And um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, you know, why not Indian scientists and Chinese scientists? I mean, isn't aren't you creating a common heritage of man uh, database here, or do you do you really want to go down? I mean, does that mean b Brexit is going to leave out our British colleagues? Uh, <laughs> down that wall. I'm not even allowed to pronounce that word. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, I I think. Yeah. I'm a very pragmatic person, so I, I see, you know, you, you, if you, 
I, I, I say it many times to my colleagues and they, they, they're fed up with that, but if you tie too many problems together, you end up doing nothing. Eh? So uh, let's, let's try to speak. Our approach is fix it first at the European level and then expand. And the idea of the reciprocity goes for the rest of the world. So the, the Kazakh person, the Indian or the Chinese, yes, of course, at some, that's my personal view. At some point in time, we will, we will need to put that on the table. What will be the conditions of accessing our cloud? It is not a free cloud. Uh, open is not free. Uh, otherwise, you can just give away your data and then, and, then, and then the scientists will not longer follow. So the reciprocity idea is that, yes, okay, li just like in trade relations, uh, a for A, there is a B. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's a one direction. That, that's the idea. But the beauty of the idea is that it, it will push the, the B part uh, also to go towards fair open data and so forth. So that is, that is a little bit uh, the, 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 the philosophy behind it. But again, it is not us, Commission, who will solve it. it uh, at the end of the year, we have the executive board and uh, smart as we are, we externalize the problem to them. So. I really appreciate that response, um, and I would build on the concept of open is not free, also link it to a suggestion that Bonnie made on incentives, and I think that one next step could be to look at the macro incentives for open science and for building sustainable collaborations between different stakeholders in the U.S., in the EU, in the private and public sector, and so on and so forth. You had a response, I believe? Uh, not, not a response, just a comment um, that um, about this utopian idea, right, of the, of the science on, on the global scale, um, that it's an easier conversation for us to be having here between the United States and, and the European Union because it's a, it's a value that we already share, the, the, the value of, of, of partnering together, mm -hmm. doing science okay. together, making information available publicly. That's a value we share. It's not a value that all countries share, you know. and so it's not. It's uh, there. Th it's a long road toward this utopian idea that I can't endorse or not endorse. Not even at this personal level, I won't take that kind of risk on on camera. Uh, <laughs> um, except to say that uh, we appreciate how much the European Union values this because it's important to the United States also. Uh, and it's important enough, it's important for us and other engagements we have with other countries that don't share those values yet, um, but that we are advocating for that, that data sharing as an important value in scientific research. Jared, is there a next step around values or would you like to pass on that question? I'll, I'll pass it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can I just say, you know, in, in line with um, as close as needed but as open as possible, you do have researchers and you do have to have exceptions, but maybe you can use it and turn it into a positive. In the sense, if there's a researcher in wherever, Kazakhstan or wherever they said, that needs access, encourage them to find a partner within the European Union and then find a way to enlarge that by bringing them into um, cooperation. So you can look at it, make it positive and look for opportunities to, to make that a positive thing. We have time for three more comments. One, two, three. Yes, actionable comments uh, regarding common metrics and common indicator. The proposal is to make a census of existing indicator, not only at country level, but also at discipline level. And as we are, mm, are currently analyzing all existing indicator for on open science, for the open science model, we are very happy to act as uh, to gather and to, 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 in a way, to gather and to carry out this census. So it's not just an actual idea, it's actually a commitment on our side to, to carry it out uh, with whoever is interested. So as um, some precedent on the op in the open data world, I think there's been some informal collaboration across the US and EU and other countries on, on metadata standards for open data catalogs and common open source uh, infrastructure behind those. Uh, I don't know if there's similar work that's going on in the sort of broader open science um, space, but I think, you know, m in terms of tangible things, uh, metadata interoperability at a high level. Uh, in the open data world, that's also been incorporated with uh, major search engines and schema.org to better index th those types of things on search engines. So in any case, I think there's some, some potential precedents in the open data space that might be able to be applied to the, um, the open science space on, on metadata and open source uh, uh, collaboration. 
I love that comment, and the Open Geospatial Consortium is one partner that has domain working groups and standards development plans for advancing some work on metadata and open science. Okay, um, I was going to suggest the same thing, but also, um, first of all, we have another meeting tomorrow to see how we can establish the COFAIR implementation networks across the board, because the problem also with what Bonnie suggested is we have run into lots of troubles to try and co-fund things between the EU and uh, the EC and, and the US. Because, you know, in many of the programs that we had in, in the EC, American partners couldn't get any funding and so on, and then aligning that is very difficult. One thing that we already suggested when Phil Bourne was still at NIH, but it died when he left, was to organize a number of what we call BYODs, bring your own data, events. <laughs> they are three-day events where people come with their data. We recently did one in Boston, which was another big success. Sloan Kettering, Jackson Labs, uh, Broad Institute. You bring data and you make them fair with the top experts from the semantic uh, interoperability. In three days, you make a lot of progress. People walk away on the pink cloud, really. They love it. And those are very easy to co-fund because we could either you know, fund them from two sides or have one here, one there. They physically happen in the US or uh, in, the, in Europe. We have some nice places to go to. And people love it because you even bring together the, the data nerds and the domain specialists and after three days of pizza and beer, they actually start to talk to each other, which is amazing. So I think those are very practical things we can start to do. And they also showcase what Bonnie said that it is not rocket science to get this done. It's very achievable. Sure. So a series of BYODs, if you recommend that to the funders on both sides, that we do together, that will be great. Thank you. I think that's an excellent thought to close on. For sure. <laughs> Does the panel agree? Put a drink on. Yeah. All right, Alex, tell us about the reception. B before that, from our side, we would really like to thank, <laughs> and I'm not going to read your CV, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for, for organizing this because f we were a little bit chaotic uh, from our side and you managed it fantastically well so that it looks much more orderly than our ideas were when we approached you. So thanks a lot, Anna. Thank you.